uh, just a uh, form of housekeeping. If anybody's interested in the washroom, they're on the second floor. You can use the stairs in the back. collaboration 
and trying to focus and be an expert in the area that you've picked off, that you're responsible for. I'd love to know how important is collaboration or is it more of a co-opetition situation? No, collaboration is definitely very important. Right? Like, I mean, one of the big reasons for us to create the Cash App or one of the largest difficulties for us in the early days is in the US, banks don't talk to each other. <laughs> they don't collaborate. Uh, like in, in Canada, we have uh, ways, uh, email transfer, we can send money to each other. It's not the greatest solution, but you can send money from one bank to another. It's a, Is that Interact? Well, it's built on top of Interact, yes. Uh, but in the US, uh, before the Cash App, when we're building it, there's no way. Like, if you belong to a different bank, you can't send money to the other person without writing a check or, or doing something very complicated. For it. So, and again, those systems are very old and legacy. And they still use mainframes, and it's not a thing that will change from day to night. Uh, that's why I believe, like, if, if you rethink how that works, and crypto obviously is building all these protocols that makes all of this possible in, in the world of today, and you rethink all of that with collaboration, uh, building things that uh, will streamline uh, the APIs for how these things should be done, how do you talk to any other financial institution, uh, the same rules apply to everybody, you don't need to have like contacts within companies like Visa or any other company in order to be able to use some of this technology or make these things happen. The world, in my opinion, is going to be a much better place. <laughs> and so, so with the marketplace, right, you've got, uh, let's say, artisanal goods going into boutique stores and matching them too, so people that are looking to supply inventory, uh, create inventory. Would you ever see any tokenization those products onto something like Zero X in the future? That's a good question. Uh, definitely, yes. It's very hard to see the path from where we are today to get into that. We have to go one step at a time, but that would be a much better place to be for sure. And um, just on, on top of that, one of the things I think that's really interesting about when you look at marketplaces and things like that is, you know, predictions, future insurance, and being able to create specific outcomes, or at least forecast for them. Um, you know, guys, generally speaking, how important is predictability to controlling risk in, in the market? And if risk is going to hinder adoption and the uptake of these products, do you think that that's going to be necessary? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I would say um, the, the thing on risk is, there's probably a few big risks in the cryptocurrency space right now. Um, you know, one is the smart contract risk. So, is the smart contract you're using actually secure? And uh, that's actually a really hard risk to price because, like, the obvious thing is like, well, let's make a smart contract bet on the smart contract risk. That doesn't really work because you're basically just creating a recursive uh, solution. Um, so you haven't really gotten rid of the risk, and you also haven't really even hedged against the risk. So that's a tough one. Um, getting better tooling to make it easier to write secure smart contracts, that sort of thing, helps fix it. And then you also just have like systemic risks that are hard to like think about. It's like a good example of this is MakerDAO and you know the collateral packing it. Um, that's that's like a it's a really novel system that nothing quite exactly like it has really existed before. So how do you think about pricing risk um, and, and measuring kind of like default risk and CDPs and that sort of stuff. People have some answers but but nobody really knows everything. Even if you forget cryptocurrency, okay, just think about, like for us as a marketplace, uh, we just launched in Canada about five weeks ago. Uh, just the fact now that we have to worry about the currency conversion from US to Canadian adds some instability or some uncertainty and risk. Uh, just that is a big deal. Right? Now you add all the cryptocurrency risks and contracts and validation on top of something like that and you can see how uh, that grows exponentially. But at the same time, if it's done properly, it reduces the risk and it has atomicity and so on. It becomes a, eventually we're going to get to a much better place. Yeah. And I mean, you guys are competing, you know, DeFi is challenging the heavyweight champion in history, which is finance. It's got the deepest pockets, it's not going to roll over without any kind of fight. Um, I feel like, to me, the way that I look at the space is that timing is everything. Timing is the difference between executing and not executing. Do you guys think that the window is finite for this opportunity 
to sort of dethrone traditional finance and move it into open finance? Um, that's a good question. I mean, I think the biggest factor in the timing for DeFi uh, and adoption of DeFi is really just like, is the technology there? And uh, it is, I feel like. I feel like it is. At least, uh, you know, Ethereum 1.0 is giving us the tools we need to like realize the potential of open finance. And like, it's amazing. The potential is insane. Uh, you know, we still probably need a decade of R&D just to scale up blockchains and to uh, allow open finance to serve billions of people. But uh, it feels like now is the time because the technology is, is starting to get there. I would say it's definitely finite from the point of view that uh, it's going to happen. Somebody's going to build these standard tools, uh, and everybody and a lot of people are working on it. So, uh, whoever's working on this now makes it be the standards, whatever they have, zero X or, or some other protocol uh, or all the tools. It is the future. Right? It's going. I have no doubt that it's going to happen. And the reason why it's financial because somebody's going to create the standard. It's going to happen. So if whoever's working on it have to make sure that they become the standard. Yeah, and it's, it, there's sort of a fine line between, um, you know, standardizing things through collaboration and sort of aligning together, um, and then also balancing that with systemic risk. And I know we were talking about risk before, and so how, if we look at Make It Out, hands up, hands up in the audience, anyone familiar with Make It Out? Nice. Um, so Make It Out is, uh, for those on the screen that aren't familiar with it or anything like that, Make It Out is um, responsible for creating DAI, uh, D-A-I, which is uh, this stable coin. It's a decentralized stable coin that is backed by, currently it's backed by Ethereum, and that means if you put your Ethereum down, you can draw down against that with a smart contract ensuring that you will make, make whole or be penalized uh, otherwise. So, MakerDAO is constructed of many different parts, and finance is always markets. You know, it's always going to be two-sided, lending, borrowing. Um, you know, is this shift from single collateral die into multi-collateral die, does that keep anyone up at night? I suppose for Joey, specifically. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, it's, it's interesting because they're basically going to be adding more and more collateral types. And uh, there's certain collateral types that it, it might actually be quite dangerous to add. And so, like, I've seen people on Twitter, um, even people who work at Maker, talking about, talking seriously about the concept of, like, well, you could use a mortgage, uh, use your home as collateral for Maker. And uh, it's like people have forgotten the past decade. Uh, remember 2008? Uh, there are problems with, with doing those sorts of things. And uh, it, it's kind of the classic tale of, like, liquidity with hedge funds. You know, prior to 2008, 2006, 2007, there are these Argentinian farmland hedge funds. And they had monthly and quarterly subscriptions and redemptions. And after 08, uh, the prices had collapsed. And these hedge funds didn't end up paying back their investors until like six, seven, eight, nine years later. And so there's this concept of like liquidity is not necessarily always there. Um, and just because a market is liquid today doesn't mean that same market is going to be liquid tomorrow. And so I think that's something that is really under talked about in the maker community and should be taken a lot seri more seriously because just because we've had a 10, 10 year long uh, bull market so far doesn't mean that we're going to have one the next decade and, and in fact I would actually bet on the opposite, I bet we have a bear market in the next few years. What does a bear market do for DeFi in like your traditional finance bear market? Oh, I, I think it's good for DeFi because whenever people are um, dissatisfied with the traditional financial system that's generally the thing that will lead more people, I think, to adopt DeFi. Um, and we haven't really had that since you know, Bitcoin was created uh, during a, a financial bear market. And you know, some argue it's impossible to know, but some argue that's kind of the spark that, that led Satoshi to, to launch it. And if that happens again, well, it's, it's, it's bad for like, the average person, but I think it, it would lead to positive things for the adoption of this tech. And then maybe you know, next time around, uh, things can be so it's sort of like a two steps back, five steps forward sort of thing? Yeah. Nice. Um, uh, just on top of that, 
who gets the most value out of DeFi? And do we target them today? I mean, I think the people get the value out of DeFi are the end users of financial products that are just, you know, basically getting uh, taken advantage of by like oligopolies that uh, can charge massive fees, that can nickel and dime them. And so, I mean, it's like asking like, who, who benefits from the internet democratizing access to information? It's like, anyone that believes information and knowledge should be free benefits from it. If you want to prevent people from being knowledgeable and, and educated and informed, then it's not good for you. And I think if we were to use that same analogy, it's like, I know who De you know DeFi is bad for, and I don't really care that it's bad for them. You know, it's like these oligopolies that, you know, have like an entrenched interest in keeping things the way they are. The heavyweights we talked about earlier. Yeah. Um, what about accessing the people that haven't even heard of financial products? Do we get there? Do we get there in time? So you know, the other side of the world, people that you know, for for an understanding. Uh, Argentina, Egypt, wherever we are in the world that's got you know, really high inflation rates, they're used to sort of 0% uh, interest rate on their money. That's actually going to be a bonus because they're going to lose 14 or 15% um, over the course of the year through, uh, through their current like, local currency. How do we get to them to really add tangible value as fast as possible, do you think? And do we get there in time? Uh, specifically like these countries? Yeah, I, th I think more, you know, we've got the resources here to build really powerful products. How do we get sort of the, the infrastructure in the hands of those people that are going to capture the most value? They don't have Robin Hood, Cash App, or any Revoluts to choose from. How do we get it then, you guys think? A decade plus of R&D is scaling blockchain technology. We need like, you know, I, today, like, we're probably going to see traction in, in blockchains for basically like toy use cases, like Chris Dixon talks about, you know, like the most impactful products and technologies usually start out looking like toys. I imagine that's, the, you know, kind of what is gonna happen with blockchain technology and DeFi, is that we're gonna serve these use cases that, you know, are kind of appealing to people that are educated and informed and understand the, the promise of the technology. And that is going to allow us to continue scaling the technology and improving it and eventually reach mass adoption it, but we're not going to be able to get there immediately i think that would be like pretty challenging unless you're like uh libra if you're facebook and you have like billions of users you can skip the toy phase you know, directly to mass adoption but there are like obviously some serious trade-offs around that as well yeah, I would say, again, a very naive view of this is that if you look at the Cash App or all these other apps that are on Robinhood and there are many others that are starting to provide access to stocks and investments that weren't available to the masses, uh, to everybody. And there's a lot, a lot of traction. Right? Uh, what can be built on top of cryptocurrency and all the new technology that's coming is that uh, anybody in the world is going to be able to have access to it. Uh, I don't know what's needed to get there. We are going that direction. It's like uh, an app like the Cash App has a very hard time in today's world getting out of the United States. It's, we've been trying to bring it to Canada for forever. <laughs> Since I was, it's, it's like we worked on it here in Canada, right? In, in Kitchener, actually. And it's very hard to work on a product that you cannot actually use it day by day. And the reason for that is banks traditional banks and, and how hard they make it for uh, financial institutions to do whatever they need to do because they, it's all centralized, you control everything. And is that, is that the regulators breathing down the bank's neck or is that the banks breathing down the regulators' neck? I mean, if you think, uh, first of all, it's, every bank is different. Uh, there isn't a, a sense, uh, there isn't like a common protocol that's used to talk between all of them. Uh, you go to a different country, you're going to have to negotiate contracts with each institution there and then implement all of your protocols. It becomes a massive nightmare to go anywhere else, right? Uh, for a company like Square Engine, it's very hard to expand to a new country. 
uh, for those reasons. Now, if uh, if banking was completely decentralized and uh, anybody could you build something, you build an application like the Cash App uh, on top of a decentralized network, and uh, from day zero it's available to everybody on the world. So it's it's a matter of time for again this thing needs to become mainstream first, but right away as soon as it's mainstream in the U.S. or anywhere else, it's available to everybody in the world, which is a huge advantage. Yeah, I think that's actually interesting. So recently, Cash App, uh, they brought in sort of stocks into the app. Um, and I've always thought that one of the one of the really most exciting things uh, when I look at ZeroX is the idea to sort of, you know, provide a trade market or like a very open market where everyone can kind of build a Robin Hood out of the box almost with, you know, people supplying these tokens and ZeroX providing sort of the, you know, the conversation between uh, traders. How do you think about that, Will? Yeah, I mean, that would be amazing. So it, it might not be like, um, you know, serving like the entire global population, but I still think like the fact that, you know, people in many parts of the world can't access like publicly traded Canadian companies or like US companies. And like oftentimes these like big companies that are like the best and most attractive investments are, you know, it's like, people that, it's immigrants that are like building these companies and running them and like their family can't even like own the shares, it's ridiculous. And, and so I think like creating, tokenizing things like stocks and stuff like that and opening it up to a global population, it it is actually like a really impactful uh, use case. Yeah, I, I, I love that and I can't wait for that to be a reality as well. Like, Yes, from a public company point of view, for sure. Like, uh, I have family back. I'm from Brazil originally. I have family there, friends. They cannot buy stocks of US companies, even if they would want to, or if they, they can, it's a very, very hard process. Uh, now, that would be really cool, even for private companies. Like, when you look at uh, how hard it is to like even run a round of investments, right? And, and how hard, like, and how much money we spend on lawyers, and how much. It, how much work it takes to basically sell shares of your company to a few investors. Uh, I, I can't wait for a world where it's all, again, decentralized and tokenized and like smart contracts and anybody can do it uh, without all this overhead. Yeah, and a lot of people think about, you know, who's used Robinhood or who trades stocks in one of these sort of digital bank booking apps? Robinhood, Revolut, whatever it be. Right. Uh, another so, another problem. Another problem. One simple trade. One simple trade. Well, simple trade. Right. Okay. So, and for the other people on the stream out there um, as well, uh, what's really interesting to think about is I don't know how many people. Okay. So, people using well, simple trade. How many of you have got stocks in Apple? Yep. Okay. Cool. How many of you went to a shareholders? Sure. Okay, so one person. So if you think about that, what's really interesting is there's a big conversation about regulation and regulatory guidance and, you know, how do you collateralize, you know, ownership of a stock? The purpose is it doesn't matter, really. The fact is, the, you know, people aren't flying to go, you know, hey, Tim Cook, I've got a problem with uh, the Q3 earnings report released about iPad sales in Southeast Asia. People are going to get exposure and, and I think like that conversation is really interesting to me, um, you know, when I look at zero X. Um, do you guys think about that? Do you factor that into execution as well? So giving this sort of idea of everyone can have a stock exposed, like exposure to a stock versus, you know, how do we play towards the regulation to adopt sort of, uh, you know, the alternative, which is owning the underlying stocks that you know? There's definitely two different paths and they're both viable. So like, you know, creating like compliant tokenized securities and playing by the rules is like, you know, it might be slower, but it could be better for, um, yeah, for the ecosystem in the long run. I don't know. Uh, I, I imagine just, you know, shareholders in some ways can be like a community and or they can be users. So if, if you're a user of a product and you want to like own a stake in that that company that develops it, like that, 
that could be appealing. Uh, but I don't know. I don't know. If, I don't know how things end up. If it's you know compliant tokenized securities or if it's uh, prediction markets, you know, for synthetic Apple stock. Yeah, I mean, I think um, so. I think one thing is about on this kind of like global use case of people wanting to buy assets that they can't get access to. It's um, it's a really tough market to get into because one is the UX for this stuff hasn't improved enough yet. So that's like one prerequisite. The second is like the tech and scalability as well or dimension. And then three is like you're selling a product that hasn't existed. So it's blue ocean. It's, it's hard to pitch a product where people don't have like a conception of it. It's like one example is there's this company in, in uh, two companies in China. One's called uh, Futu and the other one's called Tiger Brokers. Uh, one of them was actually started by George Soros' old partner um, in the 80s. And so these companies, each of them are worth about, combined, they're worth about $2 billion, $2 million, which is actually small when you think of how large the China market is and how large the potential market is for Chinese nationals who want to buy you know, Apple stock or Tesla stock or whatever. So that shows that they have like Chinese partners who are really well connected, and that shows how hard it is to sell these sorts of products. But I do think like it could happen eventually uh, as awareness builds. And I think, uh, I think synthetic assets are an interesting approach because you don't have to deal with the underlying asset. You don't have to deal with like what happens if you know the underlying asset gets frozen or something. And most people today aren't buying stocks for the dividend anyways. And also most people aren't voting in shareholder meetings either. So if you just want exposure, uh, the synthetic version actually could be like a cheaper and more efficient market on blockchains in particular, than actually dealing with the real physical physical uh, stock. Do you see that going to the sort of like private funds, like, you know, picking, uh, Joey's also the, uh, the CIO of Pantera Capital, which is one of the, the first, uh, you know, Bitcoin funds sort of really early mover in the space. Um, do you see that creeping into that space as well? Um, not, not as much, just because, uh, that market like, hasn't really developed much, you know, like tokenizing private funds, mostly because there aren't there aren't really liquid venues to trade them yet. And then also, um, if you're a good private fund, uh, you, you don't need to you know raise capital from like retail investors. And so there's kind of like this mismatch where the products that do exist aren't actually the highest quality products. Um, I think if the regulations surrounding this were like ten times easier, um, and it was like super easy to do from like a logistical standpoint, then it might take off. Um, and you see this as like larger investment banks going more and more retail. You could envision eventually that investment managers would eventually go more and more retail too. Like in the 90s, if you ask somebody, do you think Goldman's gonna launch a retail-focused bank? They would've said, heck no, but here we are, and Goldman has done just that. And so you could eventually envision the same thing happening for institutional asset managers too, but it's gonna be a very long road, and not something that I, that I forecast anytime. What's changed the most over this year? Your opinion at the start of the year to now, what was the most surprising thing? We're at you know, November already. Um, this feels like it's just going like light to be um, in crypto. For all of you guys, uh, what do you think is the biggest surprise moment for the year so far? I don't know, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> I'm that was surprising, that's my answer. I'm not, I'm not really following everything closely. There's so much happening, I, I would love to know the answer as well. Uh, I'm surprised that uh, like the progress uh, on the like, scalability solutions has, has progressed as well as it has. Um, you know, I, I was relatively bullish on it at the beginning of the year, but it was one of those things where I was only like, you know, 30% confident uh, in it. And uh, at this point, I think there's a ton of scalability solutions that you know, are actually written up, the software exists, they're being tested, you know, on test networks, things like that. And there's a bunch of them that intend to ship over the next six months. Whether that's things like Bloxrout, uh, ZK rollups, optimistic rollups, uh, plasma variants, um, and a half dozen other things. And so I'm super excited for the scalability landscape because I think by the end of next year, uh, it'll be possible to have like relatively high throughput uh, transactions and that would be relatively feasible. Yeah, I, I think that's, yeah, I, I think I agree actually. The Probably the most surprising thing over the last year has been the pace of development in like zero knowledge proofs and that entire, you know, area of technology. 
because um, like, because these concepts have existed for you know for like 30 years people have been working on this stuff and like there are people that are you know building like scalable side chains and stuff uh, and like they're running on testnet ethereum like today which is pretty insane uh, yeah any audience questions? Um, yep. Hi there. I had two related questions. Um, the first is a major criticism of DeFi is regulatory, in that banks and traditional systems are forced to obey these rules that are pushed down by lawmakers. But DeFi sort of got a free pass and we're able to iterate on that. So, um, how would you respond to that? Do you think we're bypassing the system by? not working with these regulators or being able to iterate fast because we're taking additional risk. And on the topic of risk, part of my question is, what do you see as, or who do you see as being responsible for when things go wrong? Someone gets fished, someone loses their private key. Do you see this as a user risk, like your SOL? Do you see this as being a platform risk? And if so, how do you do that without centralizing layer two? Yeah, good question. So, regulator, I, I think, you know, the question of is DeFi like going around the system and kind of breaking rules and moving fast, or and is that like? So is the question is that happening or should it happen? Should it happen? I think it depends on your view of the system you're bypassing. So you know sometimes the systems that end up take you know kind of forming are they make sense when the system is formed, but in, you know, today, in, in you know, as technology progresses, you know, the regulations and the kind of, like, uh, lane that has been put in front of us doesn't really make sense anymore. And so you can either work with regulators to convince them that it should change, or you can just burn it down, or you can just go right through it. And, like, sometimes you just need to do that, honestly, in my opinion. Um, but there are also, yeah, there are also very good regulations, like, I think the ICO craze really demonstrated why, like, investor protections exist and stuff like that. Um, so it's definitely uh, not an easy answer, but I think regulators acknowledge that, and, you know, regulators will say, like, yeah, laws are important, regulations are important, but we also don't want to get in the way of innovation, at least in, in the U.S., like some, you know, some of the regulators have that position. When it comes to like whose fault is it if, um, you know, a, a user gets hacked or they like lose their private key, I mean, the, the, or, you know, the philosophy behind cryptocurrency in general is like, don't trust, verify, like, take kind of personal responsibility. Like the power behind cryptocurrency is the fact that, you know, you can take ownership of your own assets and you don't have to rely on anyone else. So I feel like it's important that we keep that philosophy of, you know, personal responsibility and like, yeah, uh, self-custody. Yeah. Other questions from the audience? Markets. Um, I think the most important things are that they remain 
global, so globally accessible at the base protocol there. Um, you know, no limits on transactions. So the idea is that like, if you're a winning better or a good trader, you shouldn't be limited because of that. In traditional money markets, it's the opposite. You get limited pretty much everywhere. If you start winning, uh, you're betting a thousand dollars a match, it'll get cut down to a hundred. Next week, maybe it's ten dollars. I see people who started with limits at a hundred thousand, they get down to a dollar fifty. So that's a big, a big problem. And then the last piece is you know, fees. Fees aren't that important, but they're they're a good piece. If you look at like Betfair, traders on Betfair who are in the top one percent traders, uh, they're charged twenty percent fees. Um, in some cases, you can get charged up to forty percent of your winnings uh, if you're in the top point one percent. Now that sounds like well, that's a small population, but in reality, those people are driving sixty to seventy percent of Betfair volumes. So it's actually a big piece of the buy volume. So that's kind of how I think about the market as, as far as people building on top of things like. Um, it, it kind of relates to his question over there, um, as far as where, where his responsibility lies. I think if you're building something on top of Augur, you might say, hey, we'll take a little responsibility. Like if something goes wrong, we'll maybe pay you back for it. But in exchange for that, we're going to charge a fee on top of you know, the base protocol. Right? Um, so you can have systems like that where you can add value, where there's certain things you can do in a centralized way that still bring through the benefits of the decentralized player. So to me, those benefits are no limits in globally accessible. Um, and, and fees. We have time for one last question, if there is one. Over here. You have a uh, general question to the group. You have a situation in which um, you have a situation in which um, major governments start releasing their own cryptocurrency. What do you think the impact will be on things like Ethereum? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, it could be, um, it could be a bad thing for the cryptocurrency space in general. Uh, people that might be interested in the technology because they, initially, you know, it's their only alternative to government currency, and then they they get, you know, they really realize the benefits of decentralization and like a, you know, a non-government alternative. But, you know, maybe we don't get as many of those people coming into the space because they're satisfied with a government-issued digital currency. But yeah, I mean, government-issued digital currencies could be like a pretty scary, um, pretty scary in my opinion. Uh, it allows, you know, governments to uh, have like a complete kind of view into everything everyone is doing with their money. And uh, having like, Financial privacy, I think, is something that everyone appreciates. Uh, whether you're, you know, like, you don't have to be doing bad things to like want to keep your spending habits and you know net worth private. Uh, so I don't know. I, I think it's like kind of a scary uh, trend. Um, I'm just going to answer this one as well. Um, I think it's really scary as well, but. I actually think that this is the biggest layup we could get as an ecosystem. If you think about the difficulty of convincing, educating, and you know, onboarding someone who's only got paper notes in their wallet versus someone that's a cash app and trying to get them to move from cash app into, let's say, MakerDAO or something like that, the friction point, I'd say it's a, it's a globally crowdsourced onboarding procedure. So, Thanks for the uh, three billion users kind of thing. Um, yeah. I think it would go against the decentralized property of cryptocurrency. It would be validation for sure, but it wouldn't work. So it would be good and not work for the government. Uh, if, if we're gonna have like a government issued digital currency, if, if the government can have transparency into like, you know, the citizens spending habits and finances, like hopefully citizens will have much, much more transparency to government spending habits. So maybe that could be a good outcome of it. All right, well, Joey, Will, Marcelo, Michael, thank you very, very much. And next up, we have Peter Kialtika. 
you could come on up to the stage. Peter's going to be leading uh, an introduction to Web3, and Peter is the co-founder, was the co-founder and CTO of Blue Layer. He was also the co-founder and CTO of Presley, but today he's the co-founder and CEO of Horizon Blockchain Games. Welcome, Peter. Thank you.